notion. Um, but the reach area here that we're, we're exploring now, like, everything's about, um, just progressing to new heights, I guess? Like, it's, it's all very geared towards that. Um, just ever onwards, ever upwards kind of thing going on. And the way that, that sense of scale shifts as you pull out, um, or as, or as the camera pulls out, is like, it's, uh, That is magical. It's really nicely done. But yeah, I was really pleased to learn that um, that the game is developed on Linux using open source tools. Hey, I think we have a developer joining us uh, in chat there. Welcome. Um, unfortunately, I'm stupid and didn't uh, didn't tweet at the beginning. And as as being mentioned on Twitter, uh, we we blew through a lot of the uh, <laughs> early interesting discussion <laughs> where we were talking about our first impressions and stuff. Um, Oh, I was just being cheeky, but... <laughs> well, it's... it's um, I guess it's one of those things, like... Uh, much in the same way that you can only experience a game for the first time once, um, it, it becomes difficult to... Because I, I hadn't really talked to anybody, you know, aside from writing the article that I wrote. I um, hadn't really talked to anybody about the game or how it made me feel, uh, or, or what my first impressions were. Um... But actually, Chris, if you if you are at all interested, you are totally welcome uh, to join us in Mumble. Uh, I can get you the server details if you're interested in joining us for a chat. Uh, no pressure. And there's that uh, that pulling out again. One of the few points in the Reach set of levels where you move inwards. Oh yeah, and, and again, here's, here's more of that same stuff where... Um, the game shows you what's going on, uh, even when you're in tight confines, you know. Whoa! Yeah, so it doesn't feel like anything ever comes at you like as a surprise, or that the game's trying to cheat you in any way. Right, right. It, uh. Every 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 problem seems like if 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 you change your approach, you can get through it. Yeah, and I I feel like like um, subliminally that's the message that rotating the uh, environment gives you. Uh, you know, when you die and it and it reframes things. Um, yeah. Uh, would you mind, would you mind passing, uh, just popping the server details into, uh... Sure. Uh, into chat there. Unfortunately, I've got the chat window slightly behind the game, and so I can't read it all. Uh, if there's anything I need to respond to, uh, let me know. And I like that after after the stuff that we just done. Oh, whoops! After the stuff that we just done, that this uh, this undulating um, section here is a really interesting change of pace. So, ah, close. Um, also found myself really enjoying the, um, we could go this way this time. No, we're not. <laughs> uh, the inner section of this, uh, this area, uh, I quite liked. Um, it gives that little throb before, uh, stuff moves. So everything is continually moving. Ah, uh, what am I doing? Right, I'm gonna do this properly now. Uh, everything is continually moving um, counterclockwise. Ah. Uh, 
Um, and I just moved straight out of the area without talking about the bits I liked about it. But uh, I just I just kind of like that that everything is moving um, counterclockwise, and that intuitively you want to dock into those little alcoves because that's what you've been doing. Um, but really, I think the best bet at that point is to just be patient and sit in what feels like the danger zone um, until it's the right time to move. Uh, and I just kind of enjoy that the way that, that kind of turns turns what you've just been doing on its head uh, and invites you to, to play a little bit differently. Oops. I don't remember what's special about this bit, but yeah, it, it kind of closes in behind you. I like the sense of, of the world kind of collapsing around you um, that, that that particular bit has. Again, uh, impatience is how you uh, how you die. Yeah, I was just about to comment that that's one <laughs> thing that I really like about this game the most is that it kind of emphasizes patience over Twitch. Yeah. Also, I'm like, I'm a big Amiga fan, and all I see in all these levels is the red bouncing ball. <laughs> bouncing ball? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, here we go. Oh, here we don't go. Whoa, what am I doing? There you go, I'm too impatient. But yeah, there, like I said earlier, there's a, there was recently a patch for the game that adjusted the, some of the difficulty, and I think, um, I think that the the challenge of of finding the right difficulty for a game like this has got to be huge, um, because I mean, it to me it feels like it's a game that is um, very much about it, like it like. I think it's first experience driven, like, it's the first experience that, um, kind of matters, and is, is probably the, the primary way that the game is intended to be experienced. No probs! Oh, more impatience. Oh, no rush. We're playing a game about patience, so... Yeah. Good to exercise that in the real world, too. Now, there's a nice pattern to this that I cannot remember, so I am actually... <laughs> contrary to everything that we had said so far, I am totally playing in a reflexive way, a uh, reactive way there. Don't panic. <laughs> Greetings! Uh, hello, is this working? Yeah, how's it going? We can hear you. Um, fantastic, this is the first time I've used this software, so um, ah. it's all very much new to me. That's alright. Um, yeah, there's there's probably no settings that you need to to worry too much about adjusting at the moment. Um, nobody's likely to type anything in chat, so you're not going to have any crazy robot voices coming after you. 
Um, but yeah, thanks for dropping right. in. Um, it's uh, it's nice to uh, finally chat with you in real time. Yeah, it's cool. Um, thanks again for all the help with the uh, multi monitor stuff on Linux. Ah, it's alright. It's just like me crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I, it uh, it did drive me crazy for a little bit when I uh, had similar problems. I kind of feel like if there's if there's a problem that I've ever encountered, that I have a little bit of an obligation to um, to allow others to um, avoid that. If that's you know, if it doesn't cost me much in terms of time or effort, then um, it's a little bit I don't know selfish to not um, to not share. All right, here comes that that bit that I was talking about. Um, I, I did have some questions about um, the kind of difficulty adjustments that you, you put in with the the most recent patch. Whether I'm I'm going to guess that that Reach here was probably the recipient of some tuning in that regard. Uh, no, uh, no, this area is no tuning uh, that I've applied ah. here. It was all to the area after that. Um, yeah, it, it was mostly, and a lot of the tuning was really subtle. Um, so it was things like. Adding like a little bit of a mic, you know, like half a second here, um, you know, slowing some things down, um, slimming down some hitboxes and stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the um, I think the bit in particular that I was thinking of with Reach was the um, when you've got that wave that chases you. Oh, okay. Anyway, so I think wait, we're in Reach. Maybe I'm getting. I, we, or, we or at least I the names for the worlds towards the end, but ah. I think this area here is rich. Yeah, and elude is the one after that because you have the. Oh, is it elude that has the wave? I, I saw the sun bit and thought maybe this yeah. was uh, was the one that I was thinking of, but if it's not, then, then yeah. that's fine. I mean, it's essentially the, the the area you're in now, like this entire kind of world, hasn't had any changes, but the world after this has. Yeah. Uh, and. If anybody who has been watching uh, for a little while uh, may notice that I have actually uh, gone back quite a way here uh, when I died, and I think that's that's an uh, that's about like we're, we're right towards the end of of this area here, um, and in terms of maintaining the the pacing of, I, I kind of kind of think of these bits as kind of I guess like gameplay crescendos. Is that kind of the way that you were thinking about them when thinking about the pacing and the the kind of pacing that the checkpoints would be able to enforce. Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, yeah, I mean, we definitely want the end to kind of peak, um, mm. and so this area, and especially the uh, the last area of the of the elude, um, where there's no checkpoints and that's quite a long area. Yeah. Um, we really want to build it up so, like, you know, it's the most challenging part of the world, and it's this big, like you say, crescendo. Um, and there also, like, musically, not so much here, but in the other level we're talking about, there yes. were things that we wanted to do that wouldn't have worked with checkpoints. Right, right. And I, I had gotten mixed up. I thought that, um, I thought we were about to have that that bit with the the chasing wave there, which is, I think that's the bit where I stopped when I kind of went, yeah, I really got to really got to get something written up now uh, and and didn't have a chance to to finish that particular area but I really did appreciate that it wasn't I guess hand holding me all the way that I had you know that I was was having to get in the right mindset and in the the right kind of rhythms um, every time so that when I approached the end that I was always in the same mindset I guess. This this motif here, um, as you move into a new region, um, is there a, is there is the design meant to sort of evoke something? I see a lot of people kind of talking about a bird motif, um, mm -hmm. but it has a sense uh, of direction about it. Uh, it yeah, um, I mean there is intention there. I kind of find it a little bit hard to describe. to talk about. Sure, like there are certain. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of things in the game um, are things I kind of created based on intuition um, and what kind of felt right. Um, and I'll probably get better at articulating why that things are the way they are, you know, as time passes and I, have, you know, I have a, have some time to reflect on the game. Yeah. But like the the bit you're talking about, yeah, I mean that was it, it was meant to kind of signify like a break 
between areas. So, okay, you've got this hub, and then here's the kind of start of a new place. Mm. Um, and I mean, we used to do that by making the uh, little entrance entrances that you move through uh, a little bit tighter as well, so that it's like uh, I don't know. It, 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 that feels more suggestive like okay yeah like you're not kind of meant to go back like if you're going back and you're moving through a very skinny hallway it kind of feels a bit off mm, mm. it's not paying attention it's totally going to go back the way I'd already gone yeah yeah uh, <laughs> it's very difficult to like play in this game and like talk about it as well yeah uh, it's that's definitely a skill I think for for most games is is being able to to talk and play at the same time. I have nothing but respect for people who uh, who are good at it. Um, yeah, I, I try and play Assault Enter a Cactus and Crypt of the Necrodancer and talk while I play, um, and they are immensely <laughs> challenging in that regard. Um, they're good practice. Uh, My, I uh, do. There was a, there was a question. Before. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. There was a question before in the chat that was a really good one um, about the death rotation idea. Mm, yeah, that was that was my question. Yeah. Um. um and I, I kind of I got a bit of a story about how that came about. Um, so previously, you know, before we put that mechanic in, the game was just like fading in and out. You know, like fade hmm. to black. You know, fade back in, and you're at the the checkpoint. Um, and I was having. So my, I have a twin brother, and he's also very much into games um, as well. And uh, he really like like one of the things that he likes to do is sort of to break down and analyze the the, the different kind of skill sets that you need in games. And at the, you know at the time, um, you know I we were playing Meat Boy, um, it just come out, and he was sort of telling me how he doesn't like the game, and he doesn't like the game compared to Mario because. Uh, like he, his thought was that this that was that there was this kind of dynamism in Mario where you have to respond to things in the moment. Hmm. Um, whereas with Meat Boy, it's very much like a memory skill game. Yeah, you know, it's like learning a bit of music. You know, it's very it's very similar to music in a way. It's just like getting down the beats, and you start to just memorize the levels and then just shave a little bit of time off. You know, like you know, save, you right. know, shave a little bit of time as you go you go through them. And for him, like that's not an interesting skill, right? Like building up memory skill is, is not interesting. Um, and he likes, and so he was like, you know, your your game is just like Meat Boy, you know. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I, I think he had a, a really good point there. And so I was thinking about how to resolve it. And one of the things that came to me was this idea about shifting the world around. Um, because it's one of the properties that you get when you're in a kind of circular space. Yeah. Um, that you're not necessarily afforded in other kinds of spaces. Um, and that also came, kind of came in line with our other, our other kind of thinking about the game, which is we want to really f flesh out the space that we're in and the properties that come out from that space. So, yeah. So that's kind of why it's in there. It's to kind of subvert memory skill, even though the game is still very much like a memory skill kind of game. Um, and then it, it does. Uh, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but it also no, no. does things like it feeds into it, it feeds into um, a kind of vibe that we're going for as well, which is like it's a bit unknown, it's a bit unfamiliar. Um, it, it kind of freshens things up as well. So it's like exactly, one of these yeah. things where we're like we just kind of like prototyped it, dropped it into the game, and was like, yeah, this is fantastic. In fact, like over yeah, yeah, um, yeah. W one week, we had. You know, I just felt like I'd watched a talk by someone, and they were like, "You should always be prototyping." Um, and so I'm like, "Okay, I'm going to drop this idea in. I'm going to drop um, the um, shrinking in and out in as well. I'm going to like prototype that to see how it works." And it was like, "Yeah, they both work really well. So they suck." Yeah, I I like as well that that. Um... The death rotation, it's like, encourages you, as you say, it keeps things fresh, it encourages you to have like, like like a slightly new perspective on things. And if if you happen to be someone who is not necessarily good at you know, performing a particular movement at a particular orientation, it's an opportunity to sidestep that as well. 
So like some yeah, of us are, are good at drawing earlier, circles but... clockwise, and some of us are not good at drawing circles clockwise. Um, you know, if you right, if you rotate things, uh, you know that that change in um, orientation can often give you a different experience, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I think um, that also feeds into a kind of. Uh, what I what I hope is like a philosophy that comes with the game, um, and this is something like uh, on my side of things. This is something I feel like I, I'm starting to appreciate now. But there is certain aspects of the game, and, and I suppose it's 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 world view or whatever that that I'm like, oh, this actually articulates my own personal beliefs. So like the world is very indifferent to you, mm. right? Um, and at the same time by switching things around in the way that it does, it also encourages you to have that new perspective. Um, and so it's kind of nice. I mean, maybe it's kind of nice that those things are reflected out in the, the final game. I'm not sure how much people pick up of that, but um, yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah, it's... I don't know. I I kind of I kind of feel like I need to finish the game before I can really nail down the uh, things that the game evokes for me um, but I, I find it I find it very evocative and very compelling like I keep I keep feeling a, a strong desire to come back and explore its secrets I guess is, is probably the best way to describe that and I very much like the way you've played with this space you know that you described before it's you know, you've got this circle, and it just seems so simple at its surface. But you, and played with it in very in a lot of different ways that none of the levels seem like a repeat of the one before. Mm. And it's 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 very refreshing. Yeah, um, that's good because it's the. I mean, one of the um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about the. Well, I thought it was, I think it's kind of interesting about the, the process behind making the game is that like making a level takes a long time, and you know, we've gotten faster, like significantly faster at making them, but we had to build our own tools and all this kind of stuff yeah, uh, to get it working. And so that gave us, it's kind of, it's kind of like the difference between like typing out um, a story or writing it by hand. You know, when you write it out by hand, you have time to think and reflect about what you're saying a little bit more. And I felt that it was the same kind of thing with creating, uh, hmm. creating the levels uh, with Expand. You know, we had time to think and reflect and then really get down this thing of like, okay, Every level has to have a, a reason to exist; otherwise, it shouldn't exist. Um, I, I like it's. What, I wish more games were kind of like that in a way, because um, whereas I, I mean, I don't want to get too much into like you know like personal views on on, on games and stuff, but it, it to me it feels like um, games, even the most simplest game like this one, right? Those, those kind of systems are very very rich, and so. Be because they're so rich, we should really be like, as designers, just like like John Blow and a whole bunch of other designers say, we should be finding the interesting aspects of them and highlighting them to the player. And and, and so like, and, and that's why with a game like this, right? You know, there's no running, there's no shooting, there's nothing like this. That you know, we can still make something that's compelling within two hours, and it doesn't feel stale. Um, or, or hopefully, people don't find it to get stale at any point. Um, it, it certainly hasn't for me. Um, but yeah, it's just like one of these things which is like, it, it's also kind of frustrating as a player though, because now I play other games and I'm like, uh, I, I, for me, I see areas where the idea is repeated. You know what I mean? Like there's this idea like, and this is especially true in puzzle games, which is you have one like idea that's in the system of the game and then because you want to make sure that players get it you know get that idea you repeat the idea again in the mm. same way but just rearrange things and that drives me crazy because it's can like... i just say that i really appreciate and enjoy the way that the the area that i've just finished um the movement challenges that it's presenting you with are quite simple but the partial obscuring of what's going on is what makes it um an interesting and, and slightly complex experience Mm. And same same for this bit where oh, you're yeah. trapped in the narrow space and you've got to, you know, it's not it's not particularly um, 
difficult set of movements that you're being asked to do. You just it's framed differently, I guess. So, so like this level here is one of the ones I updated in the patch. So I put a very small delay. Uh, I, I slowed down things a, a teeny bit, I think, um, ever so slightly. Um, it's still probably a bit tricky though. So how did you go about um, finding? It's funny when I when I first played this, uh, I felt like I breezed through this particular um, section. There we go. Hit the checkpoint. Um, but uh, let go your memory. Yes, yes. I, I, I'm sure it's more to do with just uh, divided attention and talking at the same time. It's part and parcel of uh, of streaming. Um, but I'm interested to know how you went about um, taking on board feedback and the kind of feedback that you would need um, to be able to make informed decisions about which areas needed attention, difficulty wise. Um, so was that um, was that sort yeah. of reflecting on what you'd done, or was it based on player feedback, or, or um, and if it was, how did you go about it, kind of assimilating and, and um, collecting that? Um, it's, um, it's one of these things where it's just like, I just watch people play, I don't, um, it's t it sounds really terrible and really, like, arrogant to say this, but um, I don't listen to what anyone says about the game, <laughs> for the most part. It, it, because, um, and the, re and the reason for that, though, is because we had a very clear idea about what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the suggestions we get are like, oh, you should push, you know, you should have, like, you know, a square world and you should do this. And it's like, oh, okay, we're not trying to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I totally agree with Beans My Name. Yeah, I mean, it's one of these things which is like, I mean, even more broadly beyond just games, like when you go to a restaurant, I really love going to restaurants where like, like, if I, like if I ever go into a restaurant that I've never been into before and they have like a banquet, then that'll be the first thing that I order. Cause it's like, I want to see what the chef wants me to eat. I want to have the experience that they're trying to create for me. Um, yeah. Uh, any, anyway, um, to, to answer your question, yeah. So we don't directly listen to a lot of the things that people say. Mm. Um, not in a mean way, but we watch them play. And so when fixing, like, you know, a whole bunch of the, when fixing a whole bunch of the, like, the issues and stuff, it was just a matter of watching, like, Let's Plays and stuff. And, like, seeing which areas they would, not just repeat too often, but they would repeat because they were doing silly things like clipping on the edge of something. And, yeah, like, after a while, you get a, you get a real sense for, like, okay, this bit is frustrating. Um, and this is why it's frustrating. Um, um, I mean, f for me, it's a bit tricky because, like, a lot of these areas I can play through without dying at all. So it's like <laughs> trying to figure out. Well, as as a sort of other people struggle is a bit content tricky. creator, you have like a level of intimacy um, with the stuff that you make that that others aren't necessarily going to have. Like, it's that is a real challenge to be able to. Um, to find a way to, to look, I guess, look past the um, the kind of closeness that you have to a work that you create. I mean, I guess that's not necessarily something you have to do uh, all the time, but... Um, I well, I think it's best, too, that if, you know, as a content creator, you have a vision that you're trying to, to, to create and put forth to people, so it's best to listen to that and stick to it. And, and mm. I think, it was, was it uh, Rami Ismail that said it, too, you know, Customers are both your best thing and your worst thing, you know, because especially a lot of them will have great ideas for what you should be doing, but want to stick to what your vision of the game is, especially when it's very fleshed out and, and you know what you're trying to make. Hmm. Yeah. And so, and so it's not so much just ignoring them, but you just want to acknowledge that, you know, that there's something about it because they're obviously love what you're doing enough to say something. Uh, but explaining oh, that, you know, I have a vision this is what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, um, I, and, and to be honest, it's a lot. A lot of the time, it's very hard to artic articulate that kind of thing because you know when people give feedback, they're very uh, attached to the feedback, and I suppose as a designer, you're also very attached to the designs. Mm. I mean, but it's it's most of the time it's looking. I think there's also a lot of looking behind the feedback. Okay, so you know, and, and I think Rami makes this same case. He, actually, here's an example that's like highlights it perfectly about like. I think it's like, oh, you know, this gun feels really weak or something like that. And 
the reality is the gun itself is actually not weak, but the sound effects might be, you know, not strong enough. Right. And so it's like trying to. There's also a process there of picking it apart. And like, right. Okay. This is what, like, you feel is wrong, but this is the kind of cause, or and then following that through. Um, I have. Yeah. It's also I, like sometimes it's. I've been listening and have like totally gotten out of sync with the movements that I'm meant to be doing at this point in the game. I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> I, this is kind of interesting because I find um, I, I thought like this is one of these cases where like I thought this area was pretty chill, pretty straightforward, but I noticed some people at the very end here don't know where to go, and I'm as a designer I'm actually a little bit confused by that. I'm like, okay. Um, yeah, and there's definitely things that you like you get wrong in terms of like, you know, some someone will say something, right, uh, and you'll be like, oh, okay, I think you know, I think I know what you're saying, and you're totally wrong, which kind of happened with some of the the first patch that we did, uh, the the difficulty patch, which is people were saying, oh, this area is difficult, and my initial impression was, okay. You're saying that because the very last level is hard, but in reality, it was a whole bunch of things building up to that that were actually the problem. So, hmm. yeah, it's there is a balancing thing. But the general, I think the general rule is though, like it depends what you're trying to make, right? But right, yeah, and stick to your vision first. Well, I think I I, I had this discussion with um with Tim Dawson a couple of days ago, um, that like. I, it feels that that as a as a creative person, I mean, you want to create something, right? Um, and yeah. ideally, if people come uh, to to experience something that you've created, it's because they have faith in your artistic vision and your 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 design sensibilities. And so, if anybody doesn't have that kind of faith maybe they're not part of your target audience and so some of this kind of I like just sort of thinking in with regards to cactus in particular is that there are a lot of people who uh, have a desire to exert their own creative desires onto someone else's creative work and that, that feels very odd yeah. to me well that was pretty much exactly what Rami was saying hmm Mm. Very much along the same line, but like you don't you don't that walk up to an artist who's just made an oil painting and say, "Hey, you should have used charcoal, man." Um, or go to a book signing and tell the author that perhaps in chapter six you should have let this character live or something, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't you don't go up to and a, a photographer and say, "Hey, man, you know, maybe... your camera should have been different." <laughs> it's just like, right? Let someone make what they want to make, um, because if I don't know, I just feel like we have less chance for um, diverse content if people are fixating so much on um, on on meeting uh, I, I don't want to say meeting kind of people's needs yeah, yeah, yeah I guess that is a good way to think about it sorry, I was just like diving off on some weird tangent there I know, you're doing both <laughs> you're Excuse playing me. and trying to talk at the same time yes but that idea uh, that maybe, you know, the person that's giving the feedback might not be an ideal customer for your game is also a very valid one. It's it's a very unpopular notion these days. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really... Um, especially on, like... Uh, I don't know, one of the things I've noticed uh, in preparing for, for launching the game is I was keeping an eye on Steam and what people were saying about different games. Mm. And there is a very strong sense of consumer entitlement on Steam. And it's mm. kind of interesting because you can understand why, though, right? Um, yeah. Because there's, there's, you know, like certain games come out and it's like 10, 10 bucks, and it's I don't, I don't know. It, it, well, Steam seems to be built very it's, it's much kind of, on selling. Like before the refund policy came in, um, it felt very much like the platform was geared on selling people games that they may not be interested in, but cheap enough that they didn't care. And so that, like, in the terms of the personal investment that you have in something, when that's the kind of proposition that you're faced with, you don't have any personal um, investment in the things that you you pick up and experience. Um, you just, yeah, <laughs> you have no reason to value the um, the creative intent behind something. I think. 
I, I think that's an amazing point. Um, and that shows with like kind of what the public think of indie games as well, right? You know, yeah. indie games are these weird commodities that you know should be cheap and should be in a bundle and should be you know like a lot I mean, of like, weird expectations these days. <laughs> I mean, especially when it comes to people who complain about um, um, game length. Mm, mm. Like, it's just like someone was complaining about paying was it six dollars or whatever, four dollars on sale, something something pretty cheap for like expands. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, like cup of coffee. Um, a cup of coffee is like how much? You know, especially if you get like a soy extra large coffee you know it's probably the same price and you're gonna spend like 20 minutes having that coffee mm. so it's like I don't know. yeah i mean like i i am um... or, or an experience like this where you know like you said you mentioned it's a couple of hours well that's a, a movie and these days a movie is about the exact same price right that's a really common comparison that i see people using to me the the thing i look at is like there's a game that i've played that's really short and very very well lauded and I look at that game and I think I would pay more for this game that I finished in an hour and a half than I would pay for you know this other game by the same developer that that has you know a 20 hour campaign in it um and that game's Portal because it does a lot of interesting and unique stuff and at the same time like everybody recognizes that it's it's something that is worth valuing, I think. But then you tell people that, you know, oh, I pay $60 for Portal, no problems. Um, that's that's a, like an interesting concept for people to, to think about and absorb, I guess. Yeah. It, it's kind of a shame in, in some ways, though, because a lot of, you know, people are only saying that after they've played the game. Right. In which there's no opportunity for them to, you know, like on Steam at least, there's no opportunity for them to, to help to, to throw more money towards the game. Um, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only way you can do that really is actually just you buy gift copies. Which I know that when there have been games that I've gotten for, you know, on a bundle or something like that, I come back and look at it later. I'll go, you know what? I'm going to buy this in full price and gift it to someone. Now, I know that that's not common, but mm. there are ways it's not as easy as it is maybe in other platforms. But that, that does, like, in terms of. Um... In terms of like total market, it diminishes your the number of possible um, full price sales that you can have. Like, is it, you know? Yeah, you, I, well, I think yeah. I, I really think Steam is is doing a great job at devaluing games in general. <laughs> it does sometimes feel <laughs> so. that way. But yeah, I mean, it's also one of these things which is like, in some ways, that's um, that that suits a Valve's financial interest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, like they, they, they really have no financial reason to push a game that's going to sell less, but artistically is really interesting. Um, yeah. It it is an interesting proposition. I mean, I. Um, yeah, expand expand. I think is a little bit safer than some other games in in terms of it. It stands out as being something different. Um, that you look at it and you go, okay, well, I, I'm going to judge this by different standards than I'm going to judge um, Call of Duty or, or whatever, in terms of the value that you apply to it, uh, or the value that it, you ascribe to it, um, that I think I think people might be more willing to just kind of go, yeah, well, uh, this, this short experience I'm going to value more than a short experience that a first-person shooter might have, or, or a short experience that an adventure game might have. Um, do you think that's that's possibly the case? Oh yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, as I think of games like The Fall, um, which is a game that I helped out with a little um, as well, and that's that's kind of an adventure game type thing. And it's I don't know the amount of time it takes, as with all adventure games, varies wildly um, depending upon who it is that's playing and, and whether their thought processes align with the designer's thought processes. Um, but uh, it's very very odd to me to see people complaining about the amount of time. Oh, look at you go! Oh yeah, I I remember this bit. <laughs> as I said, this is as far as I got, um, and so I have have done some of these movements a number of times. 
Uh, I thought I had it, but then I totally lost it. <laughs> but yeah, the fall cops a lot yeah, of I, I flack for being short, um, which I find really interesting. And and it's like, you know, you totally got three movies worth of of playtime out of that if you want to compare it to films. Um, yeah, it's 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 tricky. It's it is very sad to me that people don't don't value um, games as. As, as experiences specifically, or well, that some people uh, don't value well, games as experiences. There are a lot of games that are really tough to be. There's a lot of games out there though that are also put out. It's hard to quantify them as an experience. Hmm. Yeah. Totally. I. Yeah. I guess. I guess the the notion that that games are inherently comparable. Maybe that's where some of those perceptual. Turtle Sly, maybe? Well, we make comparisons in other arms, don't we? Yeah. Uh, I think it's just one of these things that... Yeah, it, it's almost as though you have to... It's one of these things that we have to... That's useful to do, but we have to understand the limitations of, like, comparisons and comparing works. Yes. Hmm. Like, you don't, you don't see many people comparing... Um, a photograph to a symphony, or or what have you, you know, like. But I think that the games, as a, a medium, if we want to consider it to be a single medium, has more um, room for diversity than any other medium that we have ever had access to, or the ability to create with. <laughs> That's all right. I've been here before. I know what I'm doing. I know how to lose. It's all good. No, I, I, I really, I, I've, I long ago, I discovered that um, you don't have to be good at something to enjoy it, and so, I don't really feel like failure is a negative experience, or I don't even want to call it failure because the game just rotates and I have another chance to try again. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm enjoying myself regardless of. Of whether or not I uh, clip the edge of the uh, the red wave there. Um, what, what do you think about the um, position that the game kind of takes on challenge? Like you have infinite lives and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like it kind of works well. I mean, like, I guess, I guess when I think about those those aspects, to me, they are they are, uh, I guess, tools for managing pacing. Um, maybe. And so, in terms of, I don't, I don't feel like lives would really help this game be what it is. Oh, that wasn't very smart. Um, and again, as I, I mentioned previously, um, I really appreciate that these, these parts in particular don't have dense checkpointing, because there's a sense of, of rhythm, I guess, or momentum, um, that I just wouldn't have an opportunity to feel otherwise. But that's that's me personally. I mean, how do you feel about the the bits yeah, that you really played? I really think being? lives would take away from. Well, lives something. Lives would take away oh, sorry. From kind of the explore the exploratory aspect of it. Hmm. You know, in that sense of discovery, when you finally get past it too, is just. I mean, we mentioned like you mentioned Super Meat Boy earlier, and how you know it really is very much about memorizing this, the the levels, learning how to you know just shape a few seconds here, here and there. But there is something after you've done a level 35, 40 times and you actually get past it, there's a sense of, ah, oh, finally got through that, and there's this relief that washes over. Same thing here, and I think that lives will take away from that. This isn't that kind of game that needs to have a limited experience. On the note of Super Meat Boy, I would like to say that I, I really think it was a masterstroke to put the, the, like the replays of the lives in there, in terms of giving people an opportunity to celebrate and acknowledge the amount of effort that they've put in. Yeah. I yeah, did it. You get to actually see your growth in the hole. Hmm. Hmm. There you go. Um, yeah, I, I think, and I also think there's this thing of like, even um, like in Meat Boy, for example, like once you've played a level <coughs> for like 40 times or something, you actually appreciate certain nuances that are in the levels mm. uh, that you wouldn't if you just killed through it the first time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. 
I'm like, a like my, my general. Oh, go on. I, I was gonna say I'm a I'm a uh, fairly big fan of a, a game called Another World, which a lot of people recognise as being very death oriented and um, accessible in a trial and error, um, you know, way. And I look at that game and I look at the way that its its checkpoints are, are placed and the way that it approaches. Um, showing p players things they need to know um, and uh, like a lot of it uh, a lot of the things that people find challenging are that kind of intentional distancing of checkpoints to maintain a sense of rhythm and a, and a sense of flow that you lose if you if you don't have that mm -hmm. um, so yeah like I, I guess I come from a perspective where um, that's something that I I personally appreciate before coming to expand. Okay. I don't know if I've done this area before. Um, possibly, yeah. Um, I, I, I might as well tell you a little bit about a kind of secret that's in the game. Not really a secret, but a, like a thing. Sure. Um, so when you get out to this open space, what happens is that if you go north and you go all the way to the exit, then we bind that exit to the first world. But if you were to go east instead of north and you got to that exit, we would then bind the east exit to the first world. Huh. So the, the, thing, the thing we did with this area is we made it so that it doesn't matter which direction you go in, uh, but the first time you reach the end of this kind of space, of the subspace that you're in, you'll get to a, you know, to the next world. Yeah, but okay. There's a little nuance in that, which is kind of interesting as well, which is that... Well, that means that direction um, is intuitive. Hmm. Yeah, that's... But it's, yeah, it's that's really neat. Yeah. Uh, but there's also something else we do as well, which is kind of... I don't think anyone has spotted it yet. Um, and... Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, we changed something in that, that bit there. I just wanted to see how you responded to it. Because um, what people used to do is they used to go backwards against the openings, and then that would they get really frustrated. But So we stopped opening the... Yeah, okay. anyway. Um, uh, but one of the things you can actually do from the open world is you can go all the way north, go to the exit. That'll bind the north exit to the first world. Then you can go back to the center and then go in another direction and then go to another exit, and then that'll bind that exit to the second world. So you can actually play the worlds out of order. I was going to ask uh, whether or not they were in a particular order or not. Yeah. Because I... I mean, th there is an order, and everyone will... Most, like, pretty much 99.9% .9 of people will play it in the order we intended. Mm. I, I do think... I do have a, a sense of, of having... Uh, approach them in a different order to the order that I've I've taken today. Um, so maybe I did that, and and I kind of recognised that that there was this kind of sense of connected space rather than uh, unconnected sequence of puzzles, uh, and wanted to explore around before diving all the way in. I think maybe I had done that unconsciously uh, early on, and not realised it. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Um. Okay, you know what? I'm going to bring it up. Um, this, this, this game has no achievements. Now, <laughs> now, it doesn't seem like the kind of game that's really conducive to that. And, but I just know that there are, there are people out there that seem to pick, up, pick games specifically because they have them. And was that an, like an, it was like a conscious decision not to include them? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's no achievements there. Um, um, I, I did put in uh, like global gameplay stats, though. Um, hmm. How do you access those? Yeah, I did put in some um, yeah, some stats. Um, well, this is yeah, actually, but yeah, for some strange reason, like they're not appearing. Oh. Um, like the game is logging them up onto Steam. I've enabled them on Steam, but I can't get them to function. Like get them to come up, and you know, I've contacted the Valve about it, but I'm not getting any responses. So I. Ah. At the moment, we're just going to leave them turned off. Um, also, because also because the levels are just like XML, and anyone can go in and um, modify them. 
Mm. Um, so it's like, yeah, I mean, everything in the game, like, you know, it, it, all, all the, like, the save files and everything are totally transparent. You know, we're not hiding anything away. You can just go in and modify your save file to skip ahead. So that's, that's I suppose, a technical reason why they're not in there. Um, but it's also just that I just totally disagree with what achievements represent. I, I do kind of feel that yeah, if you're the sort of person that gravitates towards achievements, that you probably, I don't know, Expand might not be a game that you appreciate. Well, that, you know, I'm, I, I guess because, like, for me, I'm in the middle of that, where I don't feel a game is unplayable if it doesn't have them. But on the other hand, I like ones that kind of ask you to do something that you might not find just through playing the game. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that with that sentiment. But then the the thing is, though, in some way, it's kind of an admission of defeat on the game designer because you can't, you know, you're not using game design to get people to to find that stuff, right? Well, you're not using oh, things okay, intrinsic yeah. to game design. So hmm. it's like, okay, we couldn't do anything in the game to highlight this interesting thing. So now we're just gonna put it on a list of arbitrary goals for you to get. Yeah, hmm. I like my um, my approach towards this stuff with Winter's Wake. Um, the game that I'm working on at the moment is is like I'd rather have like um, a, a room of mementos I guess that celebrates the things that people find and if there are empty slots there then that's I guess an encouragement to go and explore more I don't know whether that's suitable or appropriate for all, no, no, all games but it feels like it fits with what I'm doing Oh, definitely. Ah, oh, what am I doing? Mm. Yeah, I've always found achievements to be somewhat distracting from the gameplay. I mean, I guess it's, it's <laughs> a certain kind of game that you can design it around it. It's, it's good, but for the most part, it's just something pops up and it's like, just brings you right out of the game. Yeah. Especially partial achievements, like, oh my goodness. Oh, you know, like when right. you get, like, you know, 20 out of 30. Uh, <sighs> Queen's picked up or something. Yeah, don't oh. do that. Aha, I nearly did it again. Ah, oh, no, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. I made it. Uh, Inamoto, you know that, um, that moment in Red Dwarf where, uh, uh, it's in the episode Demons and Angels where, the cat meets the um, you know the, the the pure version of himself or whatever, uh, and he says that um, you know complains about his clothes or something. He says, "Oh, I find clothes a distraction from the the pursuit of spiritual and intellectual fulfillment." And his counterpart goes, "Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. I find the pursuit of spiritual and intellectual fulfillment a distraction from the pursuit of clothes." And it's like all I could think of when yeah. uh, when he said that there are people who. That that um, that achievements can be a distraction from the gameplay. Like I think it's like there must be people out there who feel like gameplay is a distraction from achievements. I don't doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, don't know. I got pretty strong views about the like intrinsic extrinsic kind of motivation. Um, actually, while we were preparing to ship expand, um, I was working four days a week at a company. Then we just put out a, a kid, a, a, an app for like a kid's toy brand. Um, right. And that has a lot of essentially you're playing to collect trinkets. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, it feels really weird because the game is going like really, really well. Like Apple featured it recently on the store and oh. like there's like. It must be uplifting. Downloads per day or something. So it's like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can go, I made a piece of art. Oh, and, yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then, I mean, and then even worse, even after doing all that and having like a hugely successful um, game on their hands, the, um, uh, the company that we made it for decided to um, pull a whole bunch of money. So, like, Pretty much after releasing, like just uh, yesterday, I found out like you know my contract's not being renewed and I'm out of a job too. Oh, it's like uh, um, 
I'm terrible with uh, gamepads. It's alright, I've, I've sorted something else out, but it's just like... Yeah, it's, it's a shame. And that does seem to be the trend right now. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's studio work. You know, release the game, get someone to do it, and then, yeah. And then, if it gets highlighted even, then we're not gonna renew people, and... It's sad. Yeah. But I, but I do want to say also thank you for releasing this on my birthday. Uh, <laughs> this was indeed a birthday present to myself, and I picked up the soundtrack edition. Oh. I, Chris's work on the soundtrack is amazing. Yeah, it's actually uh, my mum's. Oh yeah, he's very good. Um, he also did um, he also did the uh, um, soundtrack. Well, I think I think he did most of the, the soundtrack and sound effects for uh, Pac Man Two Fifty Six as well. Hmm, that's right. Yeah. Not that, uh, not that us Linux users have had much exposure to that. Oh, uh, yeah. What? yeah. Oh. Well, I think it was like nine months ago when I'd hit the website, and the track that was featured there was enough for me to go, yep. And then the little bits of gameplay that were there then, I was like, yep, when this comes out, I'm going to get it. That oh, awesome. And then a week before you announced it, it was like, oh, it's coming on the 30th. I'm like, yep, it's mine. Yeah, I, um... I've not regretted a moment of it. Oh, it's good. I heard about Expand from, um... From not... He, he'd been talking about it, and I was like, this sounds... You know, the, the way that you're talking about it sounds really interesting. Uh, and I went to PAX last year, and he pointed it out, you know, because you guys were next to each other, I think. Um, and I kind of hovered around, hoping to, to have a chat with you at some point, but... You had a fairly constant stream of people who seemed fairly interested in the game, and I'm like, oh, there'll be other opportunities. Um, but but sitting there and watching people play was this really interesting, relaxing experience in its own right. I th I thought it was really, um, oh wow, I'm enjoying this maze. This is cool. Um, it was a really interesting experience to to just watch people discover the game. Um, it's, it's pretty neat. I mean, I imagine that you had plenty of opportunity for that at, um, at conventions and stuff yourself. Um, but yeah, that, that was my first exposure to the game, was, um, was watching people's sense of discovery as, uh, as they came across the game. Um, yeah, that was, um, um, it, it's kind of weird being in that position because it's like uh, while you're there trying to enjoy it, like enjoy the experience of having everyone come and check out the game, you're also like <laughs> making, wanting to make it's sure very that stressful. is working fine. Keep an eye out for anyone with a press badge on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was pretty, pretty uh, tense uh, event for us. Yeah. Oh wow, the the shaking here is um, exciting. Yeah. Oh, what is going on? <laughs> wow. Um, do you like you? You've sort of hinted at um, having watched players, uh, people play the game. I mean, kind of. Do you feel surprised at all by the kinds of um, interactions that people have with the game, or the, the kinds of things that people see or find uh, in Expand? Because it um, feels like something that would not that, really, like it's to be honest, because it's a pretty. I I I mean I missed that last bit. Sorry. I I don't I don't know what like. I can't speak for anybody else's experience, but I feel that I'm having something very subjective when I play. Like it feels very personal. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure whether whether other people are going to experience it in the same way um, or, or receive it in the same way that I'm receiving it. So it's kind of an interesting thought. Is this the one where I got to press all the buttons one in a row? Yes. I watched Nat do this, so I totally know what I'm doing. So you, wait, you've seen this one. 
Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Nat did a stream, he played the entire game and I stopped. Interesting thing is... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, interesting thing is the idea from this level actually came from someone else. Um, so we actually had a, a proper level designer come on. Um, hmm. And, you know, they spent a week with the game and that's one of the ideas they had. I, um, I so feel we like... We modified it, and, yeah. I feel like that that bit that I just did. Have a good one, Silaris. I feel like that, um, the bit that I just did earlier where I kind of stomped on a whole bunch of buttons at once, I felt like that was, uh, like it's not, not a meaningful interaction, but mechanically it felt enjoyable to, um, to just knock a whole bunch of buttons in a row. Yeah, which is an interesting like a good kind of reinforcement of like, okay, there's gonna be buttons up ahead. Yeah. I do feel like it's a game that uh, that is different when you watch to when you play. Like we were talking about that um, that scaling. Well, uh, I think talking about the the scaling when you when you kind of zoom out, um, and the way that that gives you a, a sense of of scale and space, um, you just kind of, I don't feel like it, that has the same feel unless you're in control of that movement. So I having, having <coughs> briefly watched, um, not play this, um, and that's, uh, uh, Sanatan, oh, excuse me, <laughs> uh, Sanatan Mishra, um, from Witchbeam there, if, uh, if nobody's mm. familiar with his nickname. Um, but yeah, watching Nart play this particular part, um, I could see mechanically what was going on, but it's it's giving me a, a very different feel to uh, to play it first hand. Yeah. And there's more um, of that zooming in and out mechanic that is so... It is such magic to see it. Well, in this, rather than, than actively moving in and out, it's your movement clockwise or anti counterclockwise that controls the zoom. It's it's like it's a different riff on um, on that kind of movement. Um, yeah, we made um, uh, the way we kind of programmed and set up some of the um, entities in the game. Um, we did it in a very general way, which allowed us to go and to do stuff like this. Mm. So essentially, like, we can tie your movements over certain parts of the space to anything. Um, and sometimes it doesn't really make sense, but sometimes you get something cool. Um, so this one, yeah, like this one here, you're just shifting around the mask. Mm. Yeah, I, I quite like so this. Now that you bring that up. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I quite like that, um, that that's like, you reveal these things as you move. And that you're you're actively um, making things appear. I mean, they they always exist. It's just that your proximity that um, um, in this particular case is is making the difference. So I quite enjoy it. But yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I don't know. It's just so it makes me curious. That are there some elements of this that came about by accident? Like initially you looked at like, oh, why isn't this working? And then you thought, oh, this actually could be used later on. Um, yeah, th there is some stuff that was like a happy accident. Um, yeah, uh, it's really like a case by case thing. So some levels, you know, we just came up with ideas by do doodling stuff around. Then other ones, you know, you would play something like you know, play Mario or whatever. And you'd be like, that idea there is very cool. How do you how would you apply that to expand? So, like, okay, that'd be totally different to, you know, that, that I would have a totally different representation in expand. Let's like, you know, try that. Um, hmm. um, actually, with the build of the game, I, um, I've included all the test levels and stuff as well. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that was cut. Um, on the plus side there, a lot of the stuff we used, like a lot of the stuff that was cut, oh, well, it's not very good, but it's also like, I think relative to most games, we used a lot of stuff um, as well. Hmm. And have you found anybody doing anything interesting with the level editor? 
Has that, has anybody uh, shared anything no, they've not made? Not really, and, I, and to be honest, I don't read. Uh, not yet. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, the level editor is very, 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 very esoteric. Um, and isn't so isn't can, that all internally I developed mean, tools? We There's put a like, lot of effort into it. You meet your needs, and then that's what <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I used to I used to do a bit of tool programming in like the visual effects industry. Yeah. And the one thing I learned uh, was that it doesn't matter. Like, the, the most important thing about creating tools for artists is that it looks good. And so the actual like <laughs> the a level editor and stuff, it looks really good. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with like the different GUI systems in like C++. Um, but there's a, there's a uh, we use like CE GUI, which is a really, really terrible, bloated piece of trash mm. um, <laughs> uh, of a GUI system. I, I, like, it's, it's just really terrible. Like, it's just really, really terrible. Um, and it's got a whole bunch of issues with it. Um, but what, what we did though was like, it was the only thing that we could use across multiple platforms. And at the time when we were looking for a GUI system, which we should have probably rolled ourselves to think of it, uh, now, but like, uh, what we ended up doing was we, um, you know, one of the other systems we were looking at was Gwyn, and Gwyn was made by, mm. I think, like, Facepalm Studios, who do, like, Gary's Mod, and, like, they had a skin in that, um, for, for Gwyn that was really awesome, it was, like, so beautiful, and so in the end, I, I, I spent, like, about a month porting the, the beautiful Gwen skin over to see <laughs> GUI. Which was terrible, <laughs> and it was like it was like by hand editing like five thousand lines of XML, which is and then just like you know running it through. Okay, yeah, cool, this works. This doesn't work. Like, uh, um, but it looks really good. So like a lot of effort has been put into the editor, and I, we get a lot of questions about like, oh, how do you make the levels? And so, I think at least just like giving it to people so that they can check it out is is probably a good thing. Um, we're not, we're not really advertising it. Like on the Steam page, it doesn't say coming with a level editor, but people can access it if they're keen. Yeah, I'd say I, I um, probably only know about it because I was yeah. paying attention. I feel like the the timing on this bit is. Um, I mean, like I'm surprised that I'm alive. <laughs> nah, but you're a wizard. I'm a wizard, Harry. No. Oh. So, to something that you brought up earlier, too, it's like, you know, Unity is kind of like the big indie tool, as it were, and and this is not in that. You actually developed the engine for this game from scratch, correct? Using the open uh, tools. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, didn't, yeah, I didn't use Unity or anything like that. Did you have any desire to use... Um like an existing engine at any point or you're always kind of keen to to focus on your own tech um well the, the reason we focused on our own tech was not i mean there's this whole like you know uh you know like bro programmer kind of thing of like yeah i'm tough i rolled my own engine i did everything myself <laughs> like that that kind of stuff is just uh really really like dislike that kind of culture um but you know, we started the game about like five years ago now. Right. And at the time, you know, a lot of people, a lot of indies were like, you know, they were using SDL. They were, um, you know, they weren't using Unity. Like at the time, like when we started making the game, the best Unity game was like Max and the Magic Marker. Um, and so, and so we just kind of did what everyone did and just like, you know, use these tools. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the biggest kind of engine thing for Indies at that point was like XNA. And I didn't really like mm. XNA. I, mean, well, no, I didn't like it. Um, it. It seems pretty cool and it seems pretty great. And I've learned C Sharp over the last few months and it seems pretty cool. Um, but it's just like, at that point, I'm like, oh. Um, I'm, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I'd already put all this effort into making smaller games that had like some basic framework. So it's like, why not do it with C? Um, and on top of that, I'm like a, I'm a BIM guy, and so I've got like a pretty much crack cocaine um, addiction. 
Um, and so you know, so it's like it's it's, it's so great. Oh, man, Vim is so great. I mean, oh, I can do that. Oh no, I actually got hired at a job once because I just mentioned Vim during the interview. Oh, this is awesome. Um, but like, like, I, like I think even that kind of stuff like enforces things in our games, right? The fact is, like, Vim, unlike most editors, actually has a philosophy behind it. You know, like, mm. I don't. It, it just boggles my mind that people don't like just you know new programmers. I don't know the average programmer doesn't really treat Vim or Emacs um, with the kind of respect they deserve because. Like in in what other discipline do you have? Why would it's going backwards? But like in what other discipline do you have tools that um, yeah? Like what other discipline do you have tools that evolve and change and you can grow with and they take a lifetime to master? Like what other discipline you know has that? It's I, like nothing. Of of the ones that um, the ones that like you could argue that do it's like the rate of change is minuscule by comparison it's like you know there might be new architectural skill like techniques and and things that you can use um new materials to become available or whatever but they they those sorts of things happen in the span of of decades <laughs> whereas we have tools that that change and evolve in a matter of of you know weeks and months Yeah. Um. Well, and the other piece that too is like Vim and Emacs. You can make them your own, and so like you know, for no two people, is their Vim setup or their Emacs setup going to be the same? Yeah. And so you can actually tune them to your needs and not the needs of whomever designed that tool for you. Yeah. That's that's and, something and that. Even, like more importantly, I mean, I, uh... okay, okay. Go go ahead. It's fine. I was I wasn't going to say anything particularly interesting. Okay. I mean, I mean, but the, the the other thing, and this is why, like, I'm really big on Linux as well, which is that my progress. I think it's like if you're if you're politically a progressive person, then it's probably a good idea for your operating system choice to match your politics. Hmm. Um, which I think is something that should be talked about much more. But it's like if you're a developer. You know, like developers should own their own tools in every single way, not some large corporation. Um, and like at the moment, you know, Unity is the most popular game engine for indies, and you know that's that's great. No, Unity is great. And, you know, like it, it saves a lot of time and stuff. But uh, eventually, it's gonna, you know, eventually, you know, it, it's always possible for like um, for Unity to become like Adobe, right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, and I was a no, and, you know, I wasn't trying to just disparage Unity. It's just that that does seem to be common. There's a lot of indie games out there, and people look at it and go, "Oh, well, I can see this was done there." And I and I've heard it. We've seen it. There are members of the community that would just say, "Oh, I can't believe it's just another Unity game," and yet, you know, this one. Well, depending upon, it's good to highlight, you know, when someone's put that extra effort into it. Depending yeah. upon the circles you move in, there's also sometimes this mind-boggling sense. Uh, attitude of like if you don't use unity what's wrong with you um which is <laughs> when i encountered that i was like what the hell why would you roll your own yeah but i'm like i like totally yeah. believe that you can't actually, understand the wheel until you take the time to invent it so like there's yeah. this inherent I mean, value I mean, in I doing stuff appreciate the other argument, which is Yeah, um, but you know, with all that that stuff said, all the kind of annoying things you had to learn to get everything working, like you know, learning all the the, the very specific things about how uh, things work on a Mac and like you know their framework system and <laughs> all this kind of stuff. It's like, like I can understand why people don't want to deal you know, with I that. I understand why people don't want to learn that stuff, and and you know, I, I'm the same, right? Like I don't want to deal with that stuff either, but. Um, yeah, I mean, things can still be structured so that developers are doing their tools. Oh. Yeah. I died unexpectedly. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, this level's a really... Oh, no. 
yeah, you got kind of pinched. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I can see what like happened. It's a tricky one to balance because, um, because essentially, like it's a, a one small difference in one area it makes an exponential difference later on. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, oh, I was going to say something else. I've forgotten that. Um, but yeah, it feels really weird that like developers don't really own their own tools. That seems like a really bad thing. And, and, and it's only an issue when, you know, like, this will only ever be an issue when you, Unity do something like, you know, double the price or something. Then people will be like, oh, Unity, you've got a bend ship. Oh no, all our games use Unity. Oh, we're all fucked. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. you, you had the opportunity to think about that before. It's not like you can't say it's a surprise because if you don't own your stuff, then you don't own your stuff. It's like, I see a lot of people getting angry about the, um, uh, you know, Adobe, um, and, and, uh, was it Autodesk have decided that, um, Max is going to be subscription based now or something. Is it Autodesk that do Mac? Uh, Max? Mm. I think it is. Um, and a lot of people getting upset about it. I'm kind of like, well, uh, if you don't like it, don't participate. Um, if you want to own your stuff, then seek out new tools and, and try new stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's odd. Yeah, I mean, it kind of frustrates me how a lot of the... Um, it, it seems like in the last few years, a lot of the... Um, certain part of the politics behind indie game development has disappeared. Um, a certain kind of... A part of the spirit has disappeared. And... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That, that kind of feels a bit frustrating. Hmm. But I, I remember I... Because I've been oh. on and off doing game development since... Um, I, I, I guess, like, like attempting to ser <laughs> attempting to do it seriously. Um, since, like, I guess the, the mid to late 90s. And kind of early on, I got this mentality of... I want to be a game creator, not a not a tools creator, and that if I spend all of my time being an engine developer, I'm never going to have time to make anything. Um, but a bit over a year ago, um, I started making my own engine in OpenGL and SDL as um, as a little bit of prep for a game jam. I was like, I'm just going to experiment. I'm going to try this, and it was it was hugely empowering to discover that it's possible to put stuff on a screen and it's possible to grab input and it's possible to do all of this stuff in a way that's that's um that doesn't require um you know it, it doesn't necessarily have to eat into the amount of I guess it doesn't eat into the amount of time you spend doing game design but I, I mean I guess it's achievable and it it's stuff that you can do I mean uh, I guess this is a path you've taken yourself as well um do you feel that because I, I feel that even even though I might not choose to roll my own tech for everything that I do from this point forward, having this experience is certainly enriched my um, my skills and my perspectives as a developer. Do you feel like you've got the same kind of experience from from doing your own thing as well? Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, but then I definitely wouldn't advocate everyone doing that though at the same time. Um, I thought it was but interesting. It like, gets... I started working kind of with my own stuff from the ground up, and and then more recently, I've I've tried using other people's tools and you know messing around with Unity and some of the other stuff, and and I find it takes almost the same amount of time to learn to use fully somebody else's tool enough to get what you want done as it does to to write your own. Yeah, and obviously it depends but... on the complexity of what you're working on, but mm. admittedly, my, yeah, my engine's super you, simple. You also don't have the risk of. Yeah. But, but there's also no risk of, oh, I want to put this new thing in. Oh, wait a minute. Can't do that with Unity. It's closed. Uh, kind of screwed. Kind of, you know, you don't have that problem. Um, but also, like, like with Expand, right? Like, we don't load in textures. There's no textures in the game. No. Right? Like, you can you can actually use these things to... As, as a, like, creative restrictions, right? Well, well general um, purpose tool's not going to be You see the same as... thing with, like, Jason Rohrer's work. Like, it's not going to be as focused, I guess? You have the opportunity to make an engine that does what you want and does it well, um, if you're doing your own tech, whereas if you... 
If you're not, then you're taking other people's mentalities and other people's approaches and adapting them to things that you want to do. Mm. Um, but oh, you were saying so. It's very pretty. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a nice effect here, and oh, I uh, I get the sense that I'm on the cusp of of kind of ending the game, so I, I'm kind of reluctant to to dive in without um, acknowledging that. And I just sort of let the discussion continue first. <laughs> um, but you were saying um, something. I mean, there's also there's also a whole bunch of th like um, things. Oh well, yeah, you can also build on top of like there are things like polycode, um, which isn't the friendliest. It isn't the best. Sorry, it isn't the best like documented engine and stuff. But like, there are things that you can build on mm. that are open source and, and stuff as well. Yeah, like, for love sure. Love 2D. Yeah, you know, there's like a lot of a lot of that stuff out there. Um, it just yeah, it seems a little bit over overblown the response to it being like, oh, it's so difficult. Ah, oh, you know, like yeah, it doesn't seem like a balanced perspective, which is yeah, totally. Also very convenient for those in. You have power, like <laughs> unity and stuff. Yeah. A lot of the rhetoric also gives me the shits as well. You know, like yeah. it's like oh, the democratization of game development, and then you go to like a conference or something, and it's like, yeah, unity is like the blah blah blah. And it's like, oh, so. Yeah. Well, that's why I like uh, to talk about really feeling empowered like, by by making stuff myself and and getting this experience. Like, if I can say that this has been an eye opening thing for me that helps me appreciate. The decisions behind tool sets that I use, or, or help me um, make better decisions myself, then I kind of hope that that might encourage other people to explore uh, that a little bit as well. Mm. But this this section of the game, I'm 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 assuming that um, we're we're kind of at the end, um, and it's kind of eerie, um, and this kind of very dominant. Um, background noise, I guess. Um, it's certainly ominous feeling. <laughs> and it feels like we're kind of going backwards towards um, you know, the, the kind of style of presentation that the, the introduction sequence had, where it wasn't... Um, you know, it was it was a series of kind of movements and puzzles. Oh, we we have to do a little bit from each section. That's kind of cool. This is the point that I tuned out. I was like, yeah, okay. I feel like this is the end of the stream when when Matt was streaming, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna leave it here and discover it for myself. Oh, and I'm not paying attention. Yeah, I get that feeling too. But unfortunately, I'm uh, <laughs> enjoying this a bit too much to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the the variations on the um, uh, types of of movements and and I guess let's call them puzzles that the game presented you with earlier when you're in in the individual sections. Like it's not it's not a direct rehash of uh, of stuff we've seen before. It's um, it's that stuff but shaken up a little bit, I guess. This is very much like an epilogue, where it's just kind of recapping what's happened, but not making you go through the whole thing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the only bit in the game where we kind of recycle things. Uh -huh. But it still does feel kind of fresh, because it's the presentation and the the actual specifics of the the movement challenges are um, are different. Yeah, I think it's also one of these things where it's like, because a lot of the levels aren't, I don't want to say it, like, uh, like they're not as identifiable, that people kind of forget things they've already seen. Like when we were doing some playtesting of the game, you know, there were several people who played and they were like, oh, you've put a whole bunch of new levels in. And it's like, no, you actually played those levels like two months ago. <laughs> 
Oh, that would have been me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just stop for a moment and say that I, I really like the oscillating patterns. Do that, though. I mean, I really think so. That have been used uh, at at different portions, just to kind of. I mean, I assume that they're there to fill in um, what would otherwise be kind of disinteresting blank spots. Um, but I like I like the the kind of presence that. Um, that this, this kind of oscillating, throbbing, undulating stuff has. Um, particularly, there's like some some lattice work uh, in. Um, uh, I can't remember which area it was. Um, I quite like that as well. So. I, I kind of, I don't, I don't know whether it's a question I want to ask before I finish. Um, but there were um, in the, because this this kind of originated as a a concept that you started exploring during a game jam, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, something has gone wrong. Um, oh shit! Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, oh damn it! Uh, I think I think I'm gonna uh, return no. to the last checkpoint. I here. just hit start. Yeah, that might not work either. Oh, no, if you just go uh, start, you try to restart from last checkpoint. Yeah, it's it's taking me back. It's okay. Um, I have no idea what I did. I wasn't watching. All right. Okay, uh, <laughs> um, I think I died. Uh, yeah, I. I Oh, fuck. Okay, Sorry. That's the first time that's been. I, well, I feel bad whenever I expose a bug, a bug on. No, no, no. On stream. It's my fault. Haven't you done that before? Have, Sorry. Have I done that before? No. I, I believe Cheese has done this before. Oh, in oh, terms okay. of exposing bugs during streams or falling out of yes, the world? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, that's no, that's my shtick. <laughs> <Don't write it. laughs> yeah, I, um, I was streaming cool. Airscape and, um, had had uh, Daniel and um, um, gosh I can't remember the artist's name Dita uh, on and, uh, and yeah I, I encountered a couple of bugs okay. on stream it was, it was terrible <laughs> uh, I, I I mean I don't mind it doesn't bother me personally but I just I, I can feel the uh, um, the awkward, I don't know awkwardness I guess of the situation of, of kind of having to acknowledge that something went wrong and <laughs> <laughs> and and deal with it. But that was interesting. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of funny because uh, um, before the, the night before the game went up, um, there was a guy who was doing. Some, you know, I put a uh, I put a, a small little update um, before uploading everything to the different stores, which you know takes forever yeah um hooray and, australian internet uh what happened what what happened was um yeah this, this this guy was streaming it and i'd accidentally like put in it's the worst bug but like after you played through the after you finish the first world it opens up to the end world oh and so Oops. he had like played for 20 minutes and then was at the end of the game and it's like i'm just, you know this is like 12 hours before we're gonna launch and it's like, no, <laughs> luckily, luckily, like, this is the thing that's really, um, really good about um, Steam and the, the kind of the, the way they, um, their, their content um, upload system. But essentially, I could, um, you know, like, straight away, I knew where the problem was. I fixed it in, like, 30 seconds. Um, you know, I uploaded it to Steam, like, two minutes later, and in five minutes, the guy had an update that he could, like, yeah, so he pretty much, like, got the fix on stream five minutes later. Uh, which is amazing. Oh, very nice. And that was uh, because you were able to like upload uh, the plus one for Steam, I have guess. to upload the whole game. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, which is uh, which is way way better than the other stores. Um, like on <laughs> each, you have to upload everything again, which is fine. But even like it's kind of annoying for. Um, well, it's like uh, even humble. I mean, they're... I think we're fine to talk about this stuff, but like. 
humble is terrible, yeah. I mean, you, they're you of the scale that you would expect you something else from them. Tell them that you uploaded it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you upload it, and then you like you send them an email. Oh, I uploaded it. Can you download it? Put it back in <laughs> the store for me. <laughs> uh, Which is yeah. such a. Pay- I mean, but then the question, uh, the question for developers is like, is it even worth the hassle to even go on there when, for like itch.io, right? Like, if you want to support another store besides Steam, then you can do all that with itch.io all by yourself. Don't have to worry about another person. And then you yeah. can also, and then the cut is like ten percent as opposed to thirty percent, or whatever it is on. Yeah, it's it's not as low as ten, but yeah. Yeah, I'm. I guess I guess the th- the reason people gravitate towards humble is is like um, just brand presence, you know, that they've got is huge. That's exactly it. It's recognizable. Hmm. Mm. Everyone knows who humble is at this point. That's why they can sell GTA and still be humble. Uh, yeah. Wait, yeah. they're selling GTA now. Yeah, that that paradox is the worst. Oh, you didn't see that. Nope. Yes, yes, yes. Look, I was I... like, I was so shocked. I got this email from them like, "Hi, it's a humble bundle, and there's G- a humble sale, and it's GTA 5." Wow. I, I've, I've become a little bit disillusioned and jaded as far as humble's concerned, which is very, very sad. Um, given the uh, amount of obvious enthusiasm I had for them at the beginning. But these things happen. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, a, they're a company. It's, it's up to them to make their own decisions about what directions and paths they take. Yeah. And they could also make the decision that a certain amount of a profit is enough profit, too. They certainly I'll could. I'll throw that out there as well. <laughs> I... I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm very philosophy-driven, and I'm like, if you have ideals that you present as being a part of your brand identity, then if that situation changes, you have an obligation to your customers and to your community to accurately, um, you know, convey that. It really disturbs me that it's considered acceptable for things to fall by the wayside without any direct communication about that. Hmm. So, but then back to the discussion of storefronts, was that leave us with itch? And how is it to, is that, I mean, from a developer standpoint, how, how viable is that? Um, I don't um, know, I mean, like, I... Uh, viable yeah. in terms of, like, supporting it, or...? Well, it's not a discoverability platform. Or in, like, reach, and, and for example, like, you know, like you said, when there's changes made, you know, how quickly you can get those out to people. Oh, like, in, the, in that side of things, it's just about uploading a new file, right? So, like, the difference between itch and humble is just, like, you know, the difference between waiting for someone to respond to an email and update the build, which if you're doing an update on the weekend, good luck to you. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah, but like yeah, for each IO, you really have to drive the traffic there yourself. I mean, there's no. Yeah. I mean, like we did very little. We didn't do much of a push for um, humble, but we still managed to get like a lot of sales just because it was on the store. Like each that IO was our first kind of store after Steam that we pushed. Um, it's it's like Bandcamp. It's not a discoverability platform. Yeah. It's it's but like it, it's a gateway for your existing community or, or people who already know about your game to be able to find it. You know. You know, like as, as far as ease of use goes, like each is each is pretty easy. You upload stuff. There's no there's no moderation time. There's no waiting. Nobody checks your stuff. If you upload a bad build, then <laughs> you get get to enjoy the consequences of that. But um, generally speaking, there's yeah, it's probably the most open of the platforms that I can think of. Mm. 
but yeah, it doesn't mean that I mean, kind of makes me sad though, because that means that that leads then for discoverability, which is kind of important because especially like a game like Expand doesn't fit into any specific genre. No. And and so if we don't have anything for discoverability aside from Steam or Humble, well, I I personally those are kind have of times always I I really feel like there needs to be a separation of distribution platforms from discoverability platforms. Um, and that there's potentially mm. like some some really unhealthy stuff that can happen if um, the only place that you can go to learn about something is the place where you can buy it, or like the only place where people go to find out about stuff is where you can buy. it. Yes. Only place you can buy it. Like that's how that's how mm. monopolies exist. Yeah, yeah. You know, like. Well, that's what I'm afraid of is the fact that you know, like with itch.io, it's very noisy. And so it makes it like hard to go there to find something else. But, but you were going to say something to Motor? Yeah, I was going to say mostly I use social media, so stuff like Reddit, where, you know, I mean, certainly they have specific game categories, but they also have, you know, general indie games or whatever that you can just go and see what people have, have posted that's new. And, and I think that's much, much better than having a storefront be your accessibility site. Yeah. And that, that comes back to it being like, that's. Uh, I mean, like about... it's, it's one of these things that. No, sorry, go ahead. I think it's one of these things that will be resolved over time because if you look at a, the way a lot of things seem to be working now is like um, I suppose different parts of a company seem to be like divided into infinite, infinitely smaller parts and, and outsourced to different things so I, I think it's one of these things that will be over time resolved and handled separately from the stores but until that point Yeah, like, I'd, I'd much rather see, um, things like Itch and Bandcamp that are, that are just like, here's the stuff, you know, find it however you want to find it, um, and it's a tool for, for people to find their own communities, and like, we had that, that problem, like, um, it'd be like, uh, I guess three years ago-ish, where there'd been people who'd had their heads down making games for so long that they didn't know that just being on Steam isn't enough anymore. And you know, like people who kind of come out the other end expecting that being on Steam was was going to guarantee them a minimum set of sales, and like that's not, not the reality anymore. But the kind of monopoly that Steam has allows people to have those kinds of perceptions. And so, if, like, for me, I look at stuff like... Um, say Airscape for example, if there were communities of people who were enthusiastic about platformers, their recommendation um, in terms of discovering stuff is more meaningful than a generic storefront can ever be because they're focused on the things that people who would like that game are going to find like it's when you have distribution platforms as um, discoverability platforms, I think you end up in a situation where um, nuance and niche uh, are what suffer. Maybe. I have no idea if any of that was audible above the game. The game was very excited at that point. It was. <laughs> and we're very excited too. That was great. I, I really enjoyed that tension at the end there. I could tell your voice just you know, got louder as you went. <laughs> you were very passionate about niche games not dying away. <laughs> I, I am. I am. I, um... I... I... I guess I... I guess I go off the edge of the screen here. See, the, the thing that's in my mind at the moment is, um... The ending... Well, actually, the entirety of um, of uh, the game jam game that that you kind of initially explored this this concept with, um, where it talked about your time being short and that the edge is the end and the the begin uh, the middle is the beginning, um, and that that's kind of running through my mind at the moment when I'm at this point where I think the only thing I can do is leave. Uh, the bounds of the screen. Um, try being close. 
Yeah, that's where I came from though. Like everything is expanded out from from the middle. I I think I'm gonna leave to the left. I don't know why. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> well, that was a, um, I found that to be a very enjoyable experience, so thank you. Thanks for checking it out and, and, and all your um, enthusiasm and, and having a chat. It's been really good. I don't know. I feel like I feel like if you're not passionate about the things that you like, then go find something that you're excited by. <laughs> it's like your life must be very empty if you can't can't get excited by something you like. But yeah, it's um. Do you have um, a, other projects in mind that you want to move on with, um, or is, is expand sated your um, creative drive for now? Um, at the moment, I don't know what I'm going to be doing next. Um, I'll probably, I mean, like this this game started as a game jam game like mm. five years ago. So some of the thinking that it represents is kind of my thinking from back then. And so what I'm thinking about games now is uh, quite different. Um, sure. But yeah, I'm hoping to continue. Like, you know, I want to continue to make games, of course. Um, I'll probably have them moving to a bit more of a political bent. But I'm not exactly sure. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to need some time to figure out what's next. Um, I, I worry at that... At the moment, I'm just like going through ideas in my head about what I want to cover. Yeah. I worry that that, that time that that uh, that people might need after creating something, I worry that not enough people take time off around the end of a project to recover and recuperate. Um, it seems like we have a lot of pressure at the moment. I mean, we... Uh, everybody has to do their own, own support these days, and uh, you know that's that's a big, big thing that you can't step away from. And often there are, um, you know, there are other, other concerns and pressures that, uh, that people have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, in from that perspective, it's nice to hear that uh, that you're not sure where you want to go, and that. Uh, There'll be a bit of thinking time before the next project. Um, yeah, I mean, I have... Um, I mean, yeah. Um, I suppose interwoven between making and expand, I have released a few other smaller games. Mm. And I probably want to continue that for a little while. You know, have things that I can do in three or four months. And uh, if anything bigger comes out of that, then I'll kind of pursue it, which is how expand came about yeah. um, as well i should i should link to your website um provided i can find it in my browser history yeah uh, i'll post it in, can i post it in the chat or the same uh, i don't know okay yeah it seems to work i, d I don't think it shows up as like a clickable no, link I unless i put it. it in there yeah there we go Okay, because I know, like on the the YouTube gaming thing, you can't post links, which is really weird. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I understand why they do it, but it just feels very strange. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> kind of awkward. The shit, Abbott said. Wow, the shit Abbott has said. Oh yeah. yeah. 
I what I don't understand is yeah, uh, let, let's get political here right now. What I don't understand is how Australia voted in a man who said that marital rape is okay. Like my mind is boggled. Yeah, I, mean, I don't a... understand. Yeah, he's pretty. Uh, he's another. <laughs> it's hard to explain. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's like I I don't know how many other um, Australian people might be <laughs> might be watching or listening, might not quite understand what's going on there. But um, wow, glad to be rid of him. Sad that uh, that Turnbull's probably not going to be different enough to make much of a difference. Yeah, apparently it's all about communication, not policy, right? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also hope that, that leadership uh, coups don't become something that happens during every single term. That would be quite sad as well. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. For me, I, I don't find it necessarily that it's a problem, but I think it might culminate in some other kind of change. You know, like maybe having a shorter cycles or something like... Or, or maybe having something where policy is figured out in a slightly different way. I don't know. We'll just see. We'll see what happens. It's hmm. pretty. You know, it seems like there's interesting political happenings around the rest of the world. Um, Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders seem to be like uh, good Switched figures. On. You know, very. They, yeah. they give. They give a lot of hope. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel. I feel very. Um. Very. Uh. Cynical at the moment. <laughs> uh, I hope that that people like Bernie Sanders and so on will be uh, listened to enough, and and I hope that people have enough faith in the system to believe that it can, because that's the thing. Like particularly democracy, like it requires that all all the constituents believe that they have a voice. Because if they don't, then they don't care who they vote for, and it all crumbles. You know. Well, there's that, and, and also one of the things, too, that in the United States, at least, that um, only as commander-in-chief is there certain information that they become privy to. Mm. So, as, as ideal as they may be before getting into office, once they get there, they're suddenly like, hi, here's everything our military's been up to. It's yours to deal with now. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's a tough pill as well. So, it, 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 it's a difficult thing. And I really hope that, you know we can get people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren in the places they need to be to make effective change. But on the other hand, they're going against years of institutionalized politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's, that's the tricky part is, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's definitely like you can't, if, if you are someone who is going against the grain, like it, in the, and if the system is, is totally geared against that, then it's hard to gain internal loyalty. And I mean, that that's my worry with things like leadership coups. If that becomes like something that everybody expects, then people stop believing that the the person that they vote in for is necessarily going to be the person that hangs around. Um, and yeah, if someone who could be a positive force for change comes in, then it's considered acceptable for uh, for their party or or supporters to kick them out. Then that's kind of scary. I feel like it makes change harder. Yeah, I mean, and it also seems. It, it seems like one of these things, though, that it, 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 in some ways it's good that it's hard because, um, and that conservatism is, is kind of good because it means that, you know, because if, if you had radical change overnight, then that could also just be just as disastrous. Um, so, I don't know. I, I very much sit on the, like, progressive p position in this way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of imagine that all of us uh, here are probably fairly progressive. Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, out of politics. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't believe that that's possible. Um, I do, I, going uh, back before, I... Oh, oh sorry. No. <laughs> um, uh, switching gears, uh, I, I do have a few other games on the, on the website that you can check out. Unfortunately, not all of them are Linux. Well, one of the ones I really want to recommend is not supported on Linux. Uh, I, I wouldn't. Exp it was made on Linux. It's, it's not distributed on Linux because I was a bit paranoid about some security things. But oh, uh, interesting. If you're looking to check out other games on there, I really recommend the uh, Mirai one. 
uh, again, not Linux, uh, but it's um, it takes 10 minutes to play. It's really quite different. It's got an interesting idea behind it. I think you'll enjoy it. And the Cave of Atman one is quite good. That's just in the browser in Flash, so anyone can check that out. Um, uh, providing you have Flash. They're kind of cool little things. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I was yeah, going to mention I... earlier, we were talking about like what it takes to get on Steam. It's not enough just to get on there anymore. And mm. one of the games I've been following just hit 100,000 sales, and they're not on Steam yet. And now they're thinking, oh, well, maybe we should get this on Steam. I don't know if they'll accept us. And I'm thinking, you don't need 100,000 sales. <laughs> I think you're going to make it on there. But, you know, these days, you just never know. Yeah, it's... it's it's. I don't yeah, know. like if it can sell, Steam wants it. It's tricky. I mean, we've got the, the green light stuff, and that was meant to make getting onto Steam more accessible, but it feels like everything is just as opaque as it was before. I mean, can anybody name the metrics that um, that Greenlight operates by? I mean, <laughs> it used to be the top voted <laughs> 10 wonder. or something. It's like, now it's <laughs> who knows? And how frequently does it happen? Who knows? It changes all the time. Trying to understand a metrics by which Valve operates is absolutely... Um, mm. That's like stepping into the mouth of madness. <laughs> but then the difficulty is if you make that transparent, then people will gain... You know, it, it's a system, so it can mm -hmm. be gained in some way, so then people, people do that. already so are, like, though. I mean... It's pretty tricky. It, I, I, feel like, I feel like Greenlight is being heavily, heavily gamed at the moment by, by a lot of people. But it's kind of this kind of self-defeating thing. Because if you get onto Steam, like, again, getting onto Steam isn't enough anymore. You've got to have some community visibility, and you've got to have some momentum, and you've got to have um, a little bit of press coverage if if that's part of your, um, you know, part of the the exposure model that you're going with. Um, so if you if you take a shortcut to get onto Steam, you know, you just buzz through Greenlight without taking the time to try and build um, some visibility and some awareness, then you kind of shot yourself in the foot in terms of being able to, to capitalize on that, that kind of launch visibility. Like, um, for expand, we did uh, green light. And one of the interesting things was that before we even got into like the top hundred, uh, we were greenlit. Um, so it definitely felt as though someone was looking and was like, Oh, this game looks cool. I'll just push it through. So mm. it's not, I don't know, maybe it's not all bad. Yeah. It's it's tricky. I, I, I still gravitate more towards the idea of, of things like itch um, being being a better system. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it means you've got to do more work on, on the visibility front. Yeah, and that's a tough thing too because, I mean, for someone like me who isn't really always paying attention to those things that you know like i'm not always paying attention to what somebody else might recommend or suggest it's hard to find anything there yeah well, and because i've there's never like a lot of other things that are out there that are just been pushed up with little thought behind the actual game that's being pushed up there it makes it difficult sometimes i've never gone looking for something new on itch i've only ever arrived at itch by going to but when looking at a game that i'm interested in so, like, for example, um, Chris's games here uh, on his websites, uh, on his website, um, the downloads for those are on itch. So, if you want to play um, Moyari, uh, is it is it Moyari? Moiray? Um, uh, Moiray. Moiray, yeah. Uh, if you want to play Moiray, um, you you discover it via Chris's website or, or anybody else who might be talking about it, and then you go to itch, and that's where you download it. Um... But, that said, when I look at the analytics for the stuff that I have on Itch, um, I see a lot of people coming up through, like, um, like, uh, category searches, and, and particularly random stuff. Um, a lot of people seem to come through looking for random things, like they, they press a button that says, show me a random game, type stuff. Uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Do you see yeah. a, a similar sort of pattern? Yeah, I, I just dropped a link in well, uh, uh, two things. I, I just dropped a link into the chat, which mm. links to the randomizer on itch.io. So if you like, if you just want to play something random, just go there and find stuff. Um, at the moment, like for expand, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, and I know, and I think in the last six months, 
uh, the front page of itch has become much much better so it's definitely if you're on the front page is drawing in like much more plays uh, but a lot of stuff also depends on twitter traffic as well yeah especially if you're doing like a, a free game and you're taking um like downloads and stuff oh, sorry you're taking um donations yes um like we we put out a like a care of that man game and uh no one like you know a few people checked it out on itch.io but not as much as like game jolt or Newgrounds. uh and oh, then interesting. you know like we got a tweet by like jonathan Blo we, we got a tweet by like jonathan blow um just like one tweet and then like that caused a chain of other tweets and then like a day later we've got like 80 dollars worth of donations so hmm. it's um it's very it's very um i feel like how it works. above the waves got has gotten more attention for the same amount of time on itch than it has on um than it ever did on game jolt mm. which is i don't know i it, like cuz that was part of a game jam um so it went up at the same time as a bunch of other point and click adventure games uh and then later on i put it onto itch um just so I could start to try and centralize um, my library of games, which I have totally not done yet. <laughs> um, and yeah, I kind of I was interested to see that I had higher visibility there. But I guess I don't know. Maybe maybe Game Jolt is like certain types of stuff is more discoverable on Game Jolt. Maybe I'm not sure. Yeah, I think like we the Morai game we put on Game Jolt, and we still get like a nice stream of plays just hmm. from like having been previously featured there so um i mean they changed the website earlier in the year um uh, right but it, it seems that it seems like a good place to get a nice amount of continual traffic okay um yeah it, it seems better for getting traction than itch.io but i got a feeling that difference is is starting to narrow as itch.io starts to really improve things Right. Yeah, I actually had a developer tell me that, you know, if I had feedback on how they could help discoverability there, just the idea, not necessarily that, hey, this is the newest game, go check this out, but more that, hey, these are things you're interested in, here's some more games like that, um, to give them feedback and that they're very responsive to it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's mostly run by, like, one guy, or one person, yeah. um... And the amount of effort that, that that person puts in is is a lot. Like, it feels like Itch as a platform, like, a year ago, maybe, you could step back from it and just leave it as it is. Um, and just say, this is done, it can it can look after itself. But, um, but Leaf has been pretty um, attentive, I guess, and, and willing to continually improve the platform and continually grow the platform, so that's... It's kind of nice to see. I think I think you might have one or two employees now who help out as well. But uh, Chris, while we've got you, I mean, it, um, to sort of keep the discussion going, uh, uh, do you have any games that you think are particularly interesting at the moment that that other people have made? Um, yeah. Uh... I mean, I haven't really been keeping up with uh, the, the main game scene for like ages. Um, That's game development for you. I'm, I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to do that now and go back and review stuff. Like I played the Beginner's Guide last night. I played, I finished, I finished Cactus. I uh, saw so Android Cactus, <laughs> which is really fantastic. I love Cactus. Um, I'm gonna yeah, play so through. I... So good. I'm gonna play through her story later today, and I've been playing some Nova One One One. A her story. Uh, I'm gonna add that to my list. Yeah, that, that looks really awesome. Uh, yeah, the Nova well, 111 111. I don't know how they want us to say it, but that game's okay. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty good. Um, feels like there's a lot of. Um, feels like they could have um, gotten to the interesting stuff a little bit sooner, but it's pretty cool. Um, in terms of stuff that I'd really recommend, that I think is like, um, kind of different. There's. I'll show you one of my favorite games that's free to play. As in, like, just free, not... Yeah. Now, you, uh, you mentioned the Beginner's Guide. You, you finished it, correct? Yeah. That, that is a, a single-sitting game. Do you agree that it's kind it? of difficult to talk about without 
Well, a second playthrough might be interesting just to catch nuances that you didn't catch the first run through. But well, I mean, like you pass through it without bringing sitting. up spoilers, kind of thing. Like, like oh it's, yeah, it's yeah. short. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you kind of have to talk, spoil the game to talk about it. Um, well, I haven't played it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I. I um, it's very. I mean, the game is very overt about what it's trying to get across, um, and that's the. Yes. I mean, I, I I enjoy it. Right, like I played it last night with my partner. Um, we had a good time. I'm glad I played it. It's not exactly for my taste, um, and it's definitely going to something. And I'm glad. And as you probably would expect going into it, it is a kind of a bit of a personal game. Mm. Um, yes. Yes, it is. I, I'm not a big fan of the, 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 the way of storytelling, but I totally understand that that's like how Davey kind of does things. And yeah, I um, I again, I haven't played it, so I can't I can't comment directly on it very much. But I was um, I was anticipating that it it, it might have suffered from not being the Stanley Parable. I mean, like, the Stanley Parable is so visible and so overtly a comedy that. <laughs> consumers, bless their hearts, uh, could have the wrong kinds of expectations going in, but it seems like it's been really well received. It's... One of the things is, is that it, it definitely, like, the first five, ten minutes in, you can tell it's not the Stanley Parable. It mm. is quite evident that that's not what this is. So, anybody that continues, I think, past that point understands that it's not going to be that at any point. Um, there are just elements of that game that it's difficult to discuss with anyone who hasn't already played through it. Mm. I, I feel like I'm the... Uh, that you can't discuss without having played it. I feel like I'm the wet blanket here, then. Without giving something away. Um, but, you yeah, know... I mean, I... Yeah. I, I just kind of... Coming back to Itch for a moment, um, I was going to say that lately, like, within the past six months, I've been surprised at um, certain like larger scale games or large or, or more visible games that are on on Steam and whatever. Um, I've been interesting. I found it interesting to see uh, a lot more in the way of larger games finding their way under itch. I, th I think that's that's kind of cool. And certainly a way that the, mm. that helps the platform get taken more seriously. Yeah. Um. So uh, I'll just really comment about the game I posted. So it's one of my favorite games. It only takes about 20 minutes to maybe... Yeah, maybe like 20 minutes to play. It's called 13 Gates. It's made by Ian Snyder for the 7-day FPS. The, the very first 7-day FPS um, game jam, where you made a first-person shooter in 7 days. I participated really, in that. really like that. Mm. Yeah, the Mariah game came from... Um, uh, the one about two years ago. That's what we started working on, but it took us a little bit longer to finish. Um, but yeah, 13 Gates is awesome. Really great. Uh, kind of like weird as well. Um, yeah. And that's probably... That's a, 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 I'll, I'll only give one recommendation. And I think that's that, a pretty good one. That first 7 day FPS was... Um, just like... Um, as a first jam... It's had an incredible legacy, I think, because mm. um, we've seen a lot of, and and you know the, the subsequent ones as well. I mean, we've seen a lot of a lot of stuff come out of um, out of those jams. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of other jams that uh, have have since seeded other games, but um, but yeah, 70 FPS in particular just feels pretty special to me. It's the first jam I participated in. And it was cool to uh, to be involved. A lot of good stuff came out of it as well. Like uh, mm. I think Super Hot came out of the jam. I, um, I think that was out of um, not not last year's, but the year before. Mm. Like not the first one, the second one. Yeah. Yeah. That was the one that I did. Um, I think I did dance for that one. Dance. Dance, yeah. I hope that um, uh hope that we yeah, have another one this year. I don't know. I haven't haven't sort of heard anything uh about that yet. 
but fingers crossed. Um, I posted another link as well. Um, this is not really a game, but it's something that's pretty cool. Um, if you have a webcam, go check it out. Um, play with it for like 10 minutes. Um, yeah. But as an aside, I'm probably going to have to disappear pretty soon. Um, I've actually got a few things I need to chase up. No worries. Well, thank you very much for uh, for sharing a bit of time with us. It's been a bit of fun. I'll, I'll chuck an archive of this up somewhere um, for anybody to check out afterwards. Um, but yeah, it's been really nice to, to talk about Expand and other bits and pieces. Yeah, no, no worries. Thanks for um, thanks for streaming the game. It's uh, it's been a good, it's been a really good chat. So it's really great to like talk to people who have an interest in this game. And, uh, oh, cheers. I'm also going to be at like PAX Australia, so if anyone's there, come say hello. I'm going to be at the um, Hacknet booth. So Hacknet is a, a hacking game that's made by a friend of mine. Oh, nice. Um, and, and and he's currently in the process of porting it to uh, Mac and Linux as well. It's currently only, only Windows, but it will be on Linux, um, which is really awesome. Um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It, it's kind of made by a Windows guy. It's a game about like hacking and using the terminal made by a guy who's on Windows, so... What was the game Maybe called again? You will, but it's, it's a hacknet. Um, hacknet. Hacknet. Just... This sounds familiar. Is that um, who is making that one? Uh, is it already released? Uh, yeah, it came out on Steam uh, two months ago. Months yeah, ago. there it is. Yeah, that's. Probably... Yeah, there it is. Ah, actually, um, that was something I, I wanted to ask before you disappear. If you have a, if you have a minute, that is. Yep. Um, was what do you think about the current state of the um, Australian game development industry? Oh, uh, it's pretty loaded question. Uh, it is. What do I think about it? Uh, I think it's good. I mean, it, it's definitely in a very positive spot in terms of. The kind of games, especially in the last few months, right? You know, like mm. Cactus, Hacknet, um, Amelo, all these you know, satellite really rain games, and not just like great. Ga- uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, the thing is, we could like put a list, and then we'd still be missing a few games. Yeah. Um, and it's great, not just because these games are, you know, like well-produced games, but they're also a little bit different, and hopefully, it's moving us towards having a cultural voice mm. in in the scene i don't necessarily necessarily know what that is you know what makes a game a video game australian um but it feels like um it feels like there's some momentum gathering there unfortunately it's still like not exactly a profitable kind of thing to do <laughs> as a creative um i think people is, around which, the world feel really that sucks, pressure but, yeah um but I, I think the kind of you know in the last six months has been really awesome, really great year for Australian mm. stuff. Um, mm. Hopefully the momentum keeps on going, um, because I, th- I think I feel like I mean, having Australia, events you know, like, of uh, yeah. international significance like um, PAX and um, I like the Game Masters exhibition and that sort of stuff. Having that stuff uh, appear in and originate in Australia, um, I think that helps gel things a little more like helps give a little bit more grounding in terms of getting local consumers to be celebrating local creators and like the the introduction of those kind of events you know we'll see the i suppose reap the rewards of having that stuff not now but with the next generation of people who come through yeah for sure Um, um, cause like we released expand now, but back when we started, you know, the things that we were going to were like free play in Melbourne mm-hmm. and like, there's a small event in Adelaide, you know, that was set up as well. Um, but yeah, now there's a new way of, way of people and there's people coming in and they're like, wow, look at the standard, you know, this is what we got to, you know, this is the, the level we got to reach now. And that's really great. Um, yeah, I mean, there also seems like there's more, um, more interest in Australian developers actually going abroad. And pushing their wares overseas, which um, I, I suppose is a little bit annoying because that's in some ways a, a necessary thing to do, because the um, the American press has so much sway, and mm. if you're not going to these events, then you are missing out on a lot of potential coverage. Which 
it's kind of shitty because you know the internet kind of brings us all a bit closer yeah. um but it, it's also great that there is this willingness of like okay we're doing great stuff and we need to show the world that we're doing this stuff um and that's really awesome yeah um, yeah um but yeah, definitely the last six months have been fantastic in terms of just releases. It's yeah. going to be interesting to see what everyone works on next. Yeah, yeah. It's um, Well, I know Defiant have already dived into um, working on Hand of Fate 2. Um, oh, right. Yeah, it's like, I didn't expect that to happen so soon. Um, yeah, it was pretty quick. Hmm. Yeah, kind of. I don't know. It feels it feels like it's a bit of a, a sort of a, a rude thing to broach. I guess like it's not a question I've asked very many people in terms of like, you know, you've ju- you've just finished composing your symphony. What's your next one going to be about? It's like you know, <laughs> you kind of give people a bit of a chance to 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 stop and reflect on what they've done before you ask them for more. But but it seems like it seems like people who've had recent releases have some degree of momentum with them, maybe? Um, yeah, hopefully. I mean, I suppose the other thing is, like, a lot of people I talk to now, they're like, oh, yeah, the game's great, but the next <laughs> one's got to be good too, right? You know, like, you're only a success if you can, like, follow it up or whatever. And it's like, oh. Mm. <laughs> it's such, like, a ridiculous proposition, the idea that, you know, everything you do is going to be golden. I- yeah. But you look at the film industry, like, you, you have a success and everybody loves you, and the moment that you misstep and the moment that you may have a failure, you're out. It's like, when you've got I something so success-driven. That's, that's where Michael Caine is a great example. Because Michael Caine would say, yep, I did that one for cash. I needed to make rent that time. You know, and so there was a lot of bad films that he did, but everybody seems to kind of gloss that over because of the good films he did. I think he more along the lines of writers and um, directors. Oh, well... Writers are disposable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's also kind of a, a bit more of a problem in Australia because we have a uh, tall poppy syndrome mm. um, as well. Um, where so if someone gets you know really established and really successful, we kind of tear them down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I don't know. Like we had we had a lot of closures over the past twelve months of of noted Australian studios. It kind of feels like after that, everybody's a bit... Um... I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It could just be the people that I interact with, um, but it feels like everybody's a little bit more, I guess, cautious and, and supportive, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... It, I mean, everything looks great now in terms of all the games coming out and, and, and releasing and everything, everything like that, but it's... Uh, we're not going to be able to properly understand the result of that until, you know, some time from now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, thanks for having me on. I got to disappear. No um, and thanks for everyone in chat um, as well, and all the all the great questions. Yeah. Yeah. I'll um, I'll probably catch you guys later. Thanks again. Thank and so if I don't talk to you beforehand, wonderful. I'll see you at Pax Australia at the end of the month. Cool. I'll catch you then. All right. Have fun. Uh, see ya. See ya. Well, that was fun and unexpected. Um, but yeah, so that's Expand uh, for anybody who is interested in checking it out. It's on Steam, it's on Humble, it's on Itch, um, and I think that's it. Uh, so I'll just throw some links in chat here, and then uh, I guess I'll wrap up the stream and, and actually get some work done today. <laughs>